All right. So as she said, I'm Owen Dix, and my project was how a carefully designed space can inspire creativity. So the first thing I did was I had to like find a problem. And the problem I found was that though everyone can be creative, there's not enough people living up to their creative potential. So in a, in a study done by Adobe in 2013, about 5,000 people took it, and eight in 10 of them said that creativity is necessary in a growing economy, and yet only a quarter of those people said they were living up to their creative potential. So I wanted to solve that problem, but first I had to realize what creativity was. And I looked all over online, and I found a lot of different definitions, but my favorite was that creativity is something unique and new that can affect a society, a town, or even a country. Something like a touchscreen phone is something so creative and so new, but it was, it was made by creativity because before touchscreen phones, it was all buttons, but someone had the creative thought to put it touchscreen, and now almost all phones are touchscreen phones. So I then went further into my research, and I started looking at the brain and what was going on in the brain while you're thinking creatively. So this picture demonstrates the common beliefs of the brain, which is that the right side of your brain has most of the creative and imaginative uh, thoughts, and the left side of your brain has most of the concrete and problem-solving ideas. But in 2013, actually, the Dartmouth Department of Psychology uh, discovered that at the root of creativity is actually imagination, and imagination actually occurs all over your brain. So creativity, actually, when you're thinking creatively, you're actually using your entire brain. So this just pushed me further and made me want to inspire people to use their entire brains and think creatively. So then I started looking for literature and different websites online. And I kept coming back to this one book, which is Make Space by Scott Dorley. It's an amazing book uh, on the Stanford D School, which I'll talk about a little later. And it talks about every aspect of a space that makes it creative and inspires people within it. And so I looked up the Stanford D School because the book was about it. And what I found was amazing. Their spaces are what I see as an ideal creative space. Everything is on wheels from chairs to tables to stools. And the space is so mobile and versatile that I kind of use it as my base creative space and the ideal creative space. I then posted a poll on my website to see where the students and whoever else looks at my website thinks they do their best thinking. And I put different answers like outdoors and at home, in school and at work, because I know these are places where people go to think, but I wanted to see where people do their best thinking. And what I found was pretty astonishing. The two places that don't really have to do with work and thinking got the least votes. Uh, like in school and at work, and yet outdoors and at home took a majority of the vote. So this meant to me that people are going to school and people are going to work, but they're not being inspired to think. Instead, they're, they're going outdoors to do their thinking or at home to do their thinking. So I, was, I wanted to know what about those two spaces made, inspired them to think and why in school and at work weren't getting as many votes. So to do that, I looked at a bunch more spaces, and I established a big three aspects of a creative space. Those big three were open space, mobility, and comfort. So open space is when you're walking through your workspace, and you're not bumping into desks. You're not breathing down someone else's neck. And you can recreate a space, because there's enough floor space where you can move desks and move people. and and uh, it makes it more versatile. Also, mobility kind of goes hand in hand with open space because mobility means that you can design the space based on a project. You don't have to kind of use the space you already have 
to do your project, you can move stuff and move tables and desks and you can create the ideal space for your project because obviously not every project is the same. And the last aspect is comfort. And this picture might be a little misleading because I don't mean snuggling up on a couch and dozing off. What I mean by comfort is that you feel comfortable in the space you're within. So when you're going into work, you should be able to share all your craziest ideas because that's how the most creative and innovative ideas come about. I'm sure whoever said, let me make a touchscreen phone, they said, you're crazy, but now touchscreen phones run the phone industry. So I then got ready to go out into the world or the greater Boston area and uh, look at creative spaces that were around us. So the first place I went was Fidelity Investments. And you might hear Fidelity Investments and be like, it's an investment company, what are they doing creatively? But what I found was actually astonishing. They have a whole floor in their Boston headquarters just for creativity and keeping their company ahead of the curve creatively and uh, technologically. They have artificial intelligence, wearables, like Google Glass and Pebble Watches. They just made an app for Pebble Watch, actually. Um, and they're doing some crazy stuff. And they're doing these crazy things within their uh, Fidelity Think Spaces, which are just awesome. I got a tour from Sean Belka, who is their who has the unofficial title of their chief innovation officer. And he showed me the space and it was crazy. The, there's huge whiteboard walls that would slide on big trap, excuse me, tracks. And there was um, rolling chairs and tables and custom lighting system. And they had a little kitchen in the corner for people to get refreshments during a presentation or a project. And it was just awesome. It encompassed all of my big three from open space, mobility, to comfort. The, the kitchen gave a comfortable feel. The chairs moving around and the tables moving around had mobility. And open space was able to be achieved, as you can see on the top picture, when everything's moved out from the middle and there's just a big open floor. The next place I went to was the RunKeeper app offices in Boston as well. And the RunKeeper app is an app that tracks your runs. It sets you runs. It sets you new goals. It can even, you can even put your height and weight and the amount you work out in the app, and it'll calculate a run for you. It's a really cool app. Um, their office is pretty small because they doubled in employees it's from 20-something from something to 40-something. So their office kind of lacks in open space, but where it lacks in open space, it gains in comfort and it gains in mobility. Because the space was, it wasn't cramped, but it was, it was very comfortable because as soon as I walked in the door, a dog went by my feet and, and <laughs> the guy who was giving me a tour named John Sullivan, who is a uh, interface engineer, told me that there could be four to five dogs in the office at any day and they're just keeping the, the guys in the office company. So a space like that is what I mean by comfort because I walked in that space and I was prepared to say, I was prepared to go work there even though I have no experience in app making, but I felt like I could share my ideas within that space and the comfort was just amazing. So the last place I went was the Zipcar offices in Boston where I met up with Jeffrey Gerlach who is an interface experience worker there. And the Zipcar office tour was probably my most interesting, not because I saw the most of my big three, but because I learned the most from this tour. As he was taking me around, he talked to me about how the architect told people he was going to take their, their ideas into account, but then really just did, made his own design and did his own thing. And because of that, the designated think spaces within the the building were actually just kind of afterthoughts that were put in wherever there was space after the initial build was already done. So if you can see this picture in the middle, that's one of their think spaces, but it's actually right across from a bathroom and there's people going in and out constantly 
And Jeff was telling me how he never goes to think there because, or never brings people there because it just seems like it was an afterthought and it was just put there because there was space there and it's not actually useful. So this tour taught me that a think space has to be the focal point of a design. It can't be just put in to the, to the building after they already put all the offices in. It has to be the center point if it actually wants to be used or else it'll just be an afterthought like this one right here. So after all those uh, tours and thinking and research, I finally got to get my hands dirty, which I was looking forward to the whole time. And, but before this, I had to find a, a space to, to do it in. And so my initial idea was that I would build outside the cafeteria because there was a plan to build a school store outside the cafeteria and I thought I could piggyback that plan and kind of build something maybe on top or next to the school store. And my initial project was actually uh, going to be a tree house, but that kind of got shut down, fire codes, and there was, <laughs> there was already uh, a team kind of working on that, so I didn't want to get in their way. So I'll let them do their thing. And then I looked for another space, and I looked at the cafeteria corner uh, where there's supposed to be a student union. And I had hoped that I could be the person to step up and build that student union. Things didn't work out with that either, so that was out of the question. And finally, I came to the Library Learning Commons, where I should have probably came first, and found a space here. The librarians were very excited about my project, and they've actually let me take over the redesign of the innovation room down the, just down the hall, uh, because that room was supposed to be, it was built to be redesigned when they, when they built the building, but no one's t uh, stepped up, so I've been able to fill that role. So in front of me here, we have the rotating whiteboard table, which I've built. And though it's not the entire space yet, I'm still working. This presentation is a part of my project, but it's not the end of my project. So this is one aspect of the space that I've built. And it's actually, this base right here is actually painted with a whiteboard paint. So this has all the functionality of your whiteboard. And then this right here is a uh, rotating wooden piece that can slide around and give you all the functionality of a normal table. So what this allows is to have multiple people at this table writing, designing, and also working, and, and it, also, it also rolls around. So it gives you the mobility from the wheels, gives you comfort because it gives you two things that you've used before, it's just redesigned. So you're comfortable with this, and it also gives you open space because you can roll it against a wall and use the floor when needed. So that's the first design within my space, but I also have a vision for what it's gonna look like when it all comes through. And so in the center there, you can see my whiteboard table, which will be the focal point of the room. Uh, but there's a, color, a couple other aspects of the room that I want to explain that you might not be able to tell because I'm not the best artist. But uh, So in the corner there, there is a, a stack of what I, what, I use, what I will use as big poster boards. And what this will do is it will allow kids to think and then uh, use mobility uh, to help them because they'll be able to post all their ideas on these post big old poster boards and all their uh, projects and things like that and then they can take the poster board and bring it to wherever they need a class or a presentation or wherever they need to bring their project. So that allows them to think within the space and then move it out uh, to wherever they need to go. Also I'm going to have some kind of mobile seating whether it be cube seating which you can stack or rolly chairs. Uh, I think that'll also be a way to get students within the door because I know kids love rolly chairs and cube seating is pretty cool too. So <laughs> that's, and it's also mobile and leaves open space when you stack them against the wall. And the final pr uh, part of my, my room design is a whiteboard track that I plan to build. And the whiteboard track is gonna go double the width of the whiteboard that's already in the room 
And what it'll do is you can slide the whiteboard to one side, write on it, and then on the other side, I'm going to put a piece of plexiglass so that you can slide the whiteboard behind the plexiglass and you can make edits to your original design based on what you're thinking without actually touching your, your original designs. And so that is my vision and I hope to inspire the creativity of the kids within this school. And even if it's just a small impact, I hope it's some impact and that it gets used from years, for years to come. And I hope everyone here has been inspired to inspire others with creativity. And I want to thank you so much for listening to my presentation. And I'm very open to questions. Are we going to rename the innovation lab the Olympics? <laughs> I'm fine with that. I I'm a green engineering major actually. Um, so that class has taught me really the design process and what it means to do a rapid build. Because we do a lot of rapid builds in there and a lot of creative thinking and and we use our space in a similar way that I want this space to be used. So it kind of gave me a base idea of, of how that space inspires me and how I can inspire others by redesigning my space. Can you explain rapidly? Uh, so how we do it in green engineering is we, we start with an idea and we build off the idea in, in a big group and then we split the idea into small different sections. And then from those small sections, we split into small prototypes and builds. And then we come together again. We talk about uh, our prototypes, and we take the best aspects of each prototype, and we make a final design. And then we redesign, and then we prototype again. We go back, and we get our final product. And then we choose whether we want to go through with a, a larger prototype and a final build. Yeah, sure. Uh, so last year, uh, Jake, Sean McIntyre, and Jake Close and I, we worked on a uh, swing water pump, which was uh, which met which the it was used for or idea for its use was that it would be brought to uh, like a third world country, and the kids that are going to pump their water instead of having to labor away with their arms, they could go and have fun and swing on the swing and get the same amount of water. And so we, we actually went to a full prototype with that and we had a fully functional uh, swinging water pump in the, in the lab for a while. We just took it down for our next project, um, but it was, it was awesome. It was a really fun time building it. And using it. And using it, yes. <laughs> um, what was your paper about? No, my paper was similar to my presentation. It just went a little more in depth uh, on like the big three and kind of how they, they were incorporated within those spaces that I want to see and how um, I didn't talk as much about my build. I talked more about existing like ideas about creativity and how that inspired my own research. So I, before I was a teacher, I was an engineer, and I would have loved to have had some creative space like this. My only question is, so where do people get like a personal space within this creative space? Because you, sometimes you need a place just to decompress by yourself and reflect and focus and you know, have your computer. And, yeah, so you know. I, I thought about that as well, because one of the, uh, John was telling me at, at Runkeeper, because they plan on uh, moving to a different building that's much bigger is because their small space, the one thing it lacks is, a, is like a quiet space, which is necessary for certain people because certain people think better in a quiet space than like a collaborative space. So my idea here was that hopefully because the room is, is so closed off that it can be either used for a quiet space or an active space because I, didn't have, I don't have enough room within that space to actually like designate a quiet space and then have like a louder space because 
they're going to hear <laughs> what the people are saying. It's, it's, it's too small to actually designate a space, but I hope that people will respect like, whoever's in there, and if they want to work quietly, they'll get to work quietly, or if they want to work as a group, they can work as a group. So, it's, this has been great, and you've done a really wonderful job. My question stems around kids that are really distracted, and when I looked at the spaces that you presented, you know, we have lots of kids here that are, it's hard for them to be in a space that's busy, and a lot of the spaces that you showed us um, are, are the example of really busy spaces. Yeah. So, what happens with all of those folks that it's harder for them? I mean, I guess the quiet space may be an answer, but... Yeah. So, my idea... And why I liked the library classroom so much is because it's isolated, like you said. And so hopefully, if kids go in there, they're going to have a project already in mind. They're not just going in there to hang out. And I mean, ideally, if I would love them to go in and then just inspire their creativity with the space. But I know that not every kid thinks that way and can just like have ideas coming off his brain. But hopefully, they go in with a project and the space inspires them to keep focused. And it's, it's a fun space, so they don't realize that they're so focused, but they're using the space and the, how creatively it is designed to actually stay on topic. So hopefully that, that's how it works. It's definitely been a very individual process, and that's been insightful because I, I've had to motivate myself more than a teacher giving me homework and having to know that I have to go home and do it or else I'm not going to get a grade. This is more, if I don't do this, I'm not going to be able to present and I'm not going to be able to stand up here and tell you guys information that I don't know about and be embarrassed for myself, but instead I can inform you guys and hopefully inspire something, and that's what the process has really taught me. Um, I think I might study business, but I'm going in undecided. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I thought it was really, really cool. This is not a question, it's a comment. I thought it was really, really cool that you learned the most from the place that had the sort of worst, I guess. Thank you. Why did you pick those three places? What led you to pick those three? So mostly it was my ability to get into those three <laughs> because not every business is willing to walk you around and show you what they're doing. Uh, but my hope was that I, I knew before going in that each of these places had a creative space. I wasn't just going into companies and hoping they did. So I chose them based on the fact that they did have a creative space, and then I kind of went in and analyzed their creative space based on what I saw. And how did you find that? How did you know that they had creative space? Uh, so I got in touch with three different people at each of the companies. At Fidelity, I got in touch with one of their, uh, what do you, like the people who kind of talk to their customers. Human, I don't, human resources? Yeah, yeah, a human resources guy who connected me to Sean. And then at RunKeeper, uh, my reader, Mr. Anderson, actually knew the guy that I talked to there, so I emailed him. And then at Fidelity, the guy, I mean, at uh, Zipcar, the guy who gave me my tour is actually my, my cousin, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and so did you research a number of companies, and these were the three that you both heard back from and had that you were looking for? Yeah, so I... I researched a lot of companies that were not around this area also that I knew I wouldn't be able to make it to. Like I looked at the Google headquarters, which is, has a really cool design. I looked at a, a bunch of different spaces, but these were the three spaces that I knew I could get into just because of the connections I had. So I kind of focused on these and made sure I could get to these and then kind of sent other emails out, but these are the only three that I really got into. Thank you very much.